it's worth studying. Well, if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 21. Chapter 21. I'm going to read just a single verse from chapter 20. You don't have to read that with me, but it really helps provide the context of what is happening in chapter 21. Uh, Chapter 20, verse 22, Paul says, Now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And then we read as his journey continues in verse 1 of chapter 21. Let's read this together. And let's remember, whenever we look at God's word, this is God's authoritative, perfect, transforming word. It intends to change us every time we read it. Let's read it with that anticipation, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 21. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus, and we agreed at the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem, Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nassan of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. May God bless the preaching of his word. There's a legend in church history, it is a legend, uh, that when the apostle Peter was fleeing Rome because of governmental persecution, uh, he suddenly saw a vision of the Lord Jesus heading back into the city. And in the legend, uh, Peter asks him in Latin, quo vadis? Where are you going? And Jesus says, I am going back into the city to be crucified again. And according to legend, this vision gave courage to Peter to turn and back into the city he goes to continue his ministry where he was eventually crucified. And as church history tells us, crucified upside down out of respect for his master. Now, we don't know whether that legend of a vision is true or not. But it does seem certain that all of the apostles kept the death of the Lord Jesus very, very close to their minds and to their heart. They, they, did, not, they did not stray far from the death of the Lord Jesus, his determination to go to Jerusalem. And certainly that seems to be the case in Luke's description of Paul's travels here. 
Certainly that seems to be the case in how Luke describes what Paul is doing. The journey of Jesus into Jerusalem is on Luke's mind because Paul, as it were, repeats almost identically Luke's description, or Luke's description of, of Jesus as he has people appealing to him not to go to Jerusalem because certainly in Jerusalem he is going to suffer. That seems to be what's happening in this, in this story. Now, we, we want to notice a couple of things as we walk through the story, then I'll, I'll apply it to us. First of all, we want to notice the accent on travel. Notice that, again, we have in this passage, Paul, Paul is traveling over and over again. He's traveling from uh, there where he was to Kos, and then from there to Rhodes, and then there for Patara, and then to uh, Phoenicia, and then he goes to Cyprus, and then finally to Caesarea, and finally he gets to Jerusalem. The sense of the passage is movement. Uh, determined movement. As I mentioned last week, it, it does bring to mind, I think, uh, Paul's uh, limitations. Paul isn't some divine being that can just snap his fingers and be where he wants to be. He's a real man. He, he has to travel from one place to the next. He has to obey God every day. Every day he has to make a new choice to continue on this journey. Every day he wakes up, he knows in Jerusalem there is suffering. He has to make the choice again to keep traveling in that direction again and again and again. So the first thing we notice is just Paul's kind of traveling tenacity. He is determined to make his way to Jerusalem. And we're told in the last chapter that the Spirit had indicated to Paul, first, that he must go to Jerusalem and that he was going to suffer. And it's not difficult if we read other sections of Scripture to determine why uh, he was going to Jerusalem. Probably he was taking an offering from the Gentile churches to give to the impoverished church at Jerusalem. That's most likely what he was doing. And he was also always determined to build unity between the Gentile churches and the church in Jerusalem so there would not be a, a Jew-Gentile divide in the church. So this is not a, a personal preference trip. This is a, a ministry trip. That's, that's necessary for Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. He has a, a calling to this. It, it's needful for him to reunite with James and the other brothers and to communicate. We're going to see in the very next chapter, Paul takes intention to, to serve, to build unity, to, to communicate to the Jewish Christians that he is not opposed to their way of life, that he has a flexibility in the grace of God. So he has a, a heart for unity and support, and it's, it's driving him to Jerusalem. So we notice first the destination. Jerusalem represents his calling and the location of suffering. But we also notice Paul's dilemma. Paul has a dilemma on this journey, doesn't he? Look down at your Bibles. Notice that when he travels, in verse 4, through the Spirit, some of these Christians are telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. That's the first thing we, we notice in verse 4 of this dilemma. Not to go to Jerusalem. Now, I think it's important, uh, just to clarify this, the, the Spirit can't say two different things. Okay, The Spirit can't tell Paul, go to Jerusalem, and then through someone else, don't go to Jerusalem. So I think the way we kind of recognize reconcile is this is the spirit is saying the same thing to these disciples there entire that he says later when Agabus communicates basically the spirit is giving them prophetic indication you are going to suffer and in that sense they are speaking through the spirit you are going to suffer in Jerusalem and they interpret that uh, to motivate them to say don't go Paul please don't go the, the spirit is indicating you're going to suffer please don't go you should not go. This is dangerous for you to go. Paul is undeterred, and he keeps traveling. He seeks out further disciples. He stays with them. This is a side note. I don't think the main note of the passage. But we want to notice the affection and hospitality present of the early church in those that served extra locally. Something present throughout Acts. Again, it's not the main point, but it's worth noticing. There's this affectionate interdependence between Paul and these churches that he planted. They weren't just consumed with their own local ministry. They had an eye towards the broader mission of the gospel and its representative in Paul. And they wanted to do what they could to host him and to greet him. And so you notice in verse 5, there's this family-wide meeting and affection that's present. The wives and the children are there, and they're praying with him, and they say farewell to one another. So this, this dilemma of 
the magnetism of affectionate and personal and relational comfort is there throughout the passage. Paul keeps leaving places where he's welcome and comforted and loved and going toward the place where he knows he's going to be hated and despised. So there's this juxtaposition in the passage. You have a, a sense of, of comfort and, and, and closeness and affection and prayer and respect. And he keeps going away from that place and into the place of danger. That, that seems to be the dilemma that, that's present, the danger that's present for Paul in this passage. He keeps traveling. Notice, he keeps going. He goes to Caesarea. He enters the house of Philip. We last met Philip chapters and chapters ago when he was evangelizing and one of the original seven deacons who became this, this evangelistic preacher. He's established a family. Apparently in Caesarea, he has four uh, single daughters who also conduct this ministry of, of prophesying. And they have this prophet Agabus who comes down from Judea. Likely he had even greater awareness of the situation close to Jerusalem. And he has this acted out parable there. This is true of the Old Testament as well, where sometimes prophets would, would physically act out uh, their prophetic word. So he, he takes Paul's belt and he wraps his own hands and feet up with it. And he begins to say, Paul, let me make this as tangible as possible. You are going to be tied up and handed over to the Gentiles. You're going to be chained and handed over. This is what's going to happen to you. And again, we notice the same dilemma. They are urging him, don't Go to Jerusalem. There's this emotional appeal you can feel in the passage. Paul, the only thing in front of you is suffering. We don't want you to suffer. Please, please stay here. Don't choose the path of sacrificial service. Don't choose to walk in this direction. There is only suffering in front of you. I remember... There's this one movie scene that affected me emotionally. Every time I would watch it, it wasn't a particularly violent scene or anything, but it was this one soldier who had been at war for so many years that his daughter had never really learned to talk. And he came home from the war, and she wouldn't talk with him. And so there's this emotional sense of the, the moment where she's not talking to him because, and, and then she knows that he's going to have to go back. And she's very sad about that. And you can sense her inner turmoil. She hasn't said anything to him. He's sort of this stranger that hasn't been around for a lot of her life. He's been at war for years, and, and, and she misses him, and she doesn't want him to leave, and you see her in turmoil. And then all of a sudden, in, in, in this movie scene, this little girl, she's five or something, she goes chasing after him down the road. Daddy, Daddy, I'll say anything. Please stay. And, I mean, I can't handle it. There's, there's people that die in this movie. I'm like, oh, that's sad. That happens? And this little girl goes chasing after her dad. Please, I'll say anything. Please. And I lose it, man. I cannot handle that scene. And I think there's something of that emotion present here. Remember, Paul is decades older at this point. He's not some young, zealous, energetic, send me where the danger is. I mean, he, he's a father of these Gentile churches. He's beloved, and he loves them. You can't read Paul's letters and not feel his love for the churches. He loves them. So they are pleading with him. He says later, they're weeping. Paul, please don't go. What can we say to you? We don't want you to suffer. So now Paul faces not only the natural you know, dilemma of not wanting himself. He's a, he's a regular man. He doesn't want to face suffering and imprisonment. He could, he could write the logic of, wouldn't it be better if I'm free to keep traveling and plant all these churches, Lord? I mean, have you seen what we've done the last 20 years? It's been pretty good. Can you really intend for me to be imprisoned and enclosed in a jail cell? Is that really best for the gospel? I mean, wouldn't it be so easy to argue his way out of this mission? And not only that, he has all of these voices of those he dearly loves pleading with him, don't go. What can we say 
to convince you. What else do you need, Paul? The Spirit has prophesied again and again and again that you will suffer. Surely that means you shouldn't go. Surely suffering service is not God's intention for you. And we don't want to face that either. So don't go. Then we come to the climax of the passage, Paul's decision. Verse 13. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready. I am ready not only to be imprisoned, not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Paul has determined by the Spirit that the service he will render to the Lord in Jerusalem, in spite of the certainty of its suffering, is God's calling for his life. He, He has determined that this service, with its accompanying suffering, is his way of honoring the Lord Jesus, of following the call of God on his life. And if we remember all the way back to the beginning of his conversion, Ananias, that early disciple who prayed over him, the Lord said to Ananias, I will show him how much he must, what? Suffer in my name. And here we are, so many chapters later, and Paul says, I am ready. The decades have not diminished diminished Paul's determination to suffer in the course of servanthood if that is what it takes. The name of the Lord Jesus is everything to him. And though he doesn't love suffering for itself, he is willing to suffer if that is what the name of the Lord Jesus requires for his life. Paul will follow the Lord Jesus into the path of sacrificial service. And I think it's, it's valuable to notice Luke is at pains here. I mean, he is at pains to make the comparison with Jesus Christ. First of all, the fact that Paul's going to Jerusalem makes that clear. He's going to Jerusalem. And for Luke, Jerusalem is sort of the center of his two-part work of Luke-Acts. And so Paul returning to Jerusalem is this very memorable moment. He's walking to Jerusalem. And also, Luke is reminding everyone of Peter's uh, sort of friends appealing to him to not go to Jerusalem. So you have this kind of reincarnation, so to speak, of the story where you have a person going to Jerusalem. It's predicted that he's going to suffer. You have friends appealing that he not go, and yet he sets his face. He is determined to go to fulfill his calling in this city. And so he's almost literally walking in the footsteps of his Lord as he goes to Jerusalem. Luke is at pains to make this connection. Now, the point is not to say that Paul or any Christian is a second Jesus, because Jesus alone bore the suffering of God's wrath for his people. There is only one atoning Savior. But, but... All those who belong to Jesus are called to follow in his footsteps in their service to him. This seems to be Paul's understanding. I am not Jesus, but I am called to follow in the footsteps of his willing servanthood, even if it's in the face of sacrifice and suffering. If God calls me to service that requires suffering, I gladly do it because it is in the name, he says, of the Lord Jesus, the suffering Savior. We see this explicitly in Matthew 16, Jesus' teaching. Let me read this passage and and read it in terms of Paul's determination. And I think the message that it would have sent to the churches as he travels. Remember, every church Paul goes to, it seems, is aware he's going to Jerusalem and probably aware of the suffering that awaits him and certainly aware of the similarities between Jesus' journey and Paul's. And so every church that he travels to has this experience. Paul is willing to suffer to serve the Lord Jesus. 
again and again and again. Every church hears this message. Paul is saying suffering in the name of Jesus is a privilege and a joy. To serve him if it costs me everything would be the honor of my life because it would reflect in some small way what he did to save me. But listen to this, what Jesus said, Jesus said in Matthew 16, listen to this. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Sound familiar? Saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus, listen, told his disciples. Oh, can't you just imagine Paul meditating on this as he journeys on the ship one day at a time to get to Jerusalem? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And I think in the context of the passage, according to what he has done in giving up his earthly life for the sake of his heavenly life. Can't you just imagine Paul meditating on that and finding joy in the face of the tears of his friends? No, I, I, I don't want to suffer. It's not like I enjoy pain. It, it's that if, if that is God's calling for me and if I can do service e even if it costs me suffering, I, I'm literally fulfilling the words of the Lord. I'm literally losing my life for the sake of finding my life. I, I'm literally demonstrating that I am following the one who suffered in my place. Not to save me, but to worship the one who saved me. Elizabeth Elliot, who herself went back to the scene of her greatest suffering, said to be a follower of the crucified means sooner or later a personal encounter with the cross. And the cross always entails loss. Always. That's what Paul says. I am ready. I am ready. What, what a phrase. I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. Stop weeping. I'm ready. I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but, but even to die in Jerusalem. Why? For the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm ready, he says. Now, I think this is the call through Paul's example to every Christian. Not every Christian will be a martyr. Not every Christian is an apostle, certainly. But every Christian is called to follow in the footsteps of the master. Every Christian is called to say, I will gladly lose my life because in Christ I have found my life. I will gladly serve regardless of the cost. I, I will gladly follow Jesus on the path of suffering. And I will gladly say to him, may the will of the Lord be done. I will say to Jesus, I am ready. I, I am ready. I am ready not because I think I'm a better Christian, because I think I'm a Christian. Not because I think I'm a special Christian, because I think I follow Christ. I, I'm, I'm not wanting to be some kind of superhero martyr missionary. I'm wanting to be a normal Christian, which means I am one found in the image of the suffering Savior. And like Jesus said, a servant is not above his master. I must follow in his footsteps. To be a Christian is to gladly embrace whatever suffering the Lord allows in the path of servanthood. It is not masochism. It's not the desire to suffer for the sake of suffering. It's the desire to do any service laid before the Christian regardless of cost, out of a joyful, glad, worshipful love for the Jesus who suffered in our place. Now, brothers and sisters, that's the call. That's the call of our lives. But what is the engine of that call? What is the motive of that call? Anybody can stand up and say, go serve sacrificially. What motivates us to do that? 
I, I was talking to someone recently and, and just pointing out, you know, it's, it's so easy to, to talk about being gospel-centered. But it's important to clarify what we mean by that. We don't just mean gospel-centered in a doctrinal sense. We mean it in an emotional, motivational sense. Someone can be doctrinally gospel-centered. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and that the Bible centers on his person and work. But emotionally and functionally gospel apathetic. You see the difference? When we say we have to be gospel-centered, we're not saying that you just sort of know in your mind that Jesus died for your sins and that you trust his righteousness and not your own. It means that the, the, the fire, the engine, the affection of seeing Christ journey to Jerusalem is fresh and real when you face an immediate sacrifice in the path of service. Today, this week, this Wednesday night. It means right now that that engine of, of gospel affection, I think that's what's the case for Paul. He says, look, I'm, I'm, I get to walk literally the road of my Lord in sacrificial service, and in his name, this suffering is something I am ready to do. He doesn't say that out of some obligatory duty. He says it because his affection and gratefulness for the Lord Jesus is driving him to such a way that sacrifice becomes an honor and loss becomes gain. We must give attention to the, the furnace of gospel affection and not just the call of gospel reflection. We must give attention to the furnace, the fire, the burning of gospel affection. My concern for many churches, our church, is that we give a lot of attention sometimes to the call of the gospel, but we give very little attention to the fire of our own hearts of gospel affection. And so it's as though there's this great engine that we're trying to push down the track. And we become fatigued inevitably and exhausted and hopeless and condemned because you can't get this train moving very far in your own strength merely with the call of getting down the track. So what should happen? Christians need to spend more time looking at the engine, at the fire, and feeding it with fresh study and fresh motivation and, and consideration and contemplation and worship and remembering Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus in the garden, Jesus on the cross. And sitting there, you say, yeah, Yes, yes, I can, I can feel the fire of affection growing again. I, I can feel it, it burning again. And now, now, now I can feel the, the engine begins to move. And I want to reflect that. Don't try to reflect when your heart is cold and, 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 and weak and, and dead in terms of gospel affection. Begin with, with motivating your heart with gospel affection. And then let the reflection begin to flow. One of my favorite quotes, and I'm sure I'll quote it again. I've quoted it before. John Stott. The cross is the blazing fire at which the flame of our love is kindled. But we have to get near enough to it for its sparks to fall on us. Brothers and sisters, if sacrificial service seems right but impossible, you ever feel that way? It's right, but it's impossible. <laughs> of course it is. You can't push a locomotive down the track. It's not supposed to be possible in your own strength by sheer duty and obligation. Open the door and look at the fire of your gospel affection. How much time are we spending at the foot of the cross? How much time are we spending walking with Jesus towards Jerusalem, reading the passages again, studying the gospel truths again, remembering his sacrifice on our behalf again, so that like Luke, it's on our mind when we're taking our own journey. I think Luke, inten Luke is here, you realize, the author. He's here with Paul. I think he intentionally wrote this in terms that would remember the journey of Jesus because it was the journey of Jesus that motivated this journey, just like it's the journey of Jesus that motivates ours. The engine of the gospel must be stoked with gospel affection so that we can follow the call of Jesus into areas of service that are costly and painful. 
There's a difference between having gospel kindling. The doctrine is present in a gospel bonfire in the heart. Now, a few applications, practical ways. How can we, in our own callings, follow Jesus in the path of sacrificial servanthood? Motivated by his salvation and his walk to save us, how can we walk down our own reflective journey of sacrificial service? Let me just give, give three kind of categories, three areas of life, spheres of life. Number one, work. Work. Paul is called to a full-time preaching itinerant vocational ministry. Most Christians are not. Now, all Christians called to represent the gospel, to bring evangelism to those that are around them, certainly to represent the word. But, but Paul's calling is unique. Not all Christians, most Christians, are not even called to full-time local gospel ministry. So how do you apply this? If you're an engineer or a lawyer or you work in the tech world or you're a musician or you're a student, how, how do you apply this with your work? How do you apply the same concepts to earthly production. Is there any connection? Maybe there's no connection. Well, sure, that makes sense for Paul. He used to preach about Jesus. What about me? I look at spreadsheets. How is that connected to for the name of the Lord Jesus? Brothers and sisters, you are a Christian. Everything you do is in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus Christ is the one who sustains this universe, providing all that is good and a blessing to everyone that is around us. Martin Luther said, look, the way someone gets milk is by a milkmaid milking. Who's giving the milk? God is. What's the means? The milk made milking. How is God going to provide the kinds of services that you provide in your work? He's going to do it through you. Now, everyone works, Christians, non-Christians, almost everyone, different religions work, but you work unto the Lord. You work for the glory of his name. You work in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that is not unspiritual because your work is consecrated to him. God made bodies. God made a physical earth. God made people that need to be served by legal aids and medical aids and musical aids and translation aids and tech aids and educational aids and all the, the jobs that are represented. God made a world in which those things are useful and beneficial. And in the name of Jesus, you can offer those things for the sake of his glory. You can do your work as unto the Lord, representing a generous Savior who still sends his reign on the just and the unjust. As a Christian, we are willing to joyfully face the burden of regular work because we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus for the good of others and for the honoring of his sustainer status over this creation. So if you're an engineer, you engineer in the name of the Lord Jesus. And where there is the choice of working, where there is the choice of working when it's going to cost you you can relate to Paul. Sometimes work costs. Sometimes doing work in the name of the Lord Jesus costs. Sometimes it costs hard hours when you're tired. Sometimes it costs walking with integrity when, when the normal uh, kind of workforce you're in doesn't work with integrity. And so you have to do extra work to, to work with integrity when many would not. Sometimes it means um, honoring uh, the name of the Lord Jesus when those around you dishonor his name. And, and being sort of an outsider when you could be an insider if only you neglected the name of the Lord. Sometimes it means uh, putting in uh, extra work to bless and honor your boss, your earthly manager, when you would rather go home and be done. Because you're doing these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you're asking, how can I honor your name in the work I do today? 
How can I honor you? How can I represent? It should be the case that our everyday work is no contradiction to the moments of witness we might receive. It should be the case that a coworker who hears us share the gospel would say, well, I mean, that's an honorable, hardworking individual, and I can see how their work glorifies their Savior. They say they belong to Jesus, and their work, it makes a lot of sense that they believe that. It doesn't mean you're smarter or supposed to make more money than the next guy. It just means the way you work is giving yourself, consecrating even your work moments, the way you write email, the way you walk through disputes at work, the way you uh, have integrity in your contracts, the way you honor your word, it brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Work, one category. It also means since work is in the name of the Lord Jesus, we don't glorify work as being a God in and of itself. Because it's in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm not trying to exalt my own name in work. It, it shouldn't be the case that a coworker would say, well, they're, they're a Christian, but they seem like they would do anything to get ahead. A Christian says, no, I would do anything to get ahead. I'd do anything to honor the name of the Lord Jesus. And that means doing some things that wouldn't get me ahead. Because God doesn't just call me to one calling. He calls me to many. He calls me to worker, he calls me to, often to family, he calls me to church, he calls me to evangelism, and I can't do any one of those things as if all the others don't exist. That's God's decision, and it's good. Work. What about money? What about money? How can we do, like Paul, in the name of the Lord Jesus, how we use our money? I'm trying to make this very practical, because not everyone's called to be a wandering missionary. Very practical. Are we willing to use the money we make as for the name of the Lord Jesus? This is especially true when honoring the Lord with our money costs us something. That's Paul's choice here. Sometimes we suffer and we had no choice in the matter. Someone gets cancer. They had no choice. They didn't choose that. It just came upon them, and they have to suffer. They have no choice but to suffer. Paul's decision here is to choose service that will result in suffering. That's a different kind of test. The choice of servanthood that results in suffering. I think money is a good example. We choose to give in a way that costs us something. It's not like money was stolen from us. You know, we, 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 you know, we came out one morning, the car is gone. No, we, we choose to give in ways that reflect that our life, like Paul says, is in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can we say, the way I apportion my money, I gladly put Jesus' name over it all? Can we say, Brothers and sisters, let, let's ask that question. The, the scriptures make it very clear. Money is one of the best representations of the condition of our heart that we have. <laughs> Where your money go, there your heart will go also. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. Look, money is this like tangible uh, self-evaluation test that God provides. It's like when you have to take your car in and it gets inspected. Look, looking at how you spend your money, it's like the inspection of the soul. How's my soul doing? Easy way to check. How's my money doing? It's, it's good to ask that question. Am I giving towards eternal things? A am, I, am I generous? Or, or is, is my money trying to protect and hold on to a certain lifestyle? Think about Paul here. Paul is basically saying, I'm willing to be restricted to a jail cell. And yet it's tempting for Christians to say, uh, what it means for the Lord to meet my needs is to have a certain size house, a certain number of cars, a certain type of vacation, a certain kind of convenience. Let's, let's use Paul's example. I, I'm ready to be restricted to like a square space like this. Why? Because it's in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let, let's ask that question. When we spend, give, budget our money, is it reflective of a heart that says, all of my life is consecrated to him? It is true that every dollar we spend or give is spent in the name of the Lord Jesus. The question is, do we like that his name is attached to the way those dollars are used? Finally, relationships. Paul's going to Jerusalem to serve the Jerusalem church, to serve the churches, to build them up in spite of the cost to himself personally. 
In the name of the Lord Jesus, we are called to serve others even when that path costs us dearly. Again, notice the difference between um, unchosen suffering and chosen suffering. That's a different message, unchosen suffering. This is chosen service that will result in suffering. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, we love even when it means dying to our rights and our expectation of being loved in return. We love, and sometimes that call requires the painful choice to bless and serve people who are prickly and blind to their own tendencies. It means we forgive even though we can't punish them then for the way they sinned against us. It means we turn the other cheek to extend affection even though it might mean we get slapped in return. It means we cross the road to bind up the wounds and pay the expenses of our enemy someone who might never have even noticed us. It means we're called to encourage our spouse even when they tend to criticize us. We're called to honor our parents even when they exasperate us. We're called to love our children even when they defy us. We're called to comfort our enemies even when they slander us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I am willing to go to Jerusalem, whatever Jerusalem the Lord has laid in front of me. Jerusalem is where the Savior died for his enemies and walked the suffering road to save me. And now that he has claimed me by his name, I can do no less than to walk the road of obedience, whatever the cost, even if it means a kind of death. You can make your own application. Work, money, relationships, every part of life, there's this opportunity to go to Jerusalem in the name of the Lord Jesus to serve in the face of suffering. And doing that, we are in good company. We do not do that alone. No, we don't. Listen to what John Piper says in conclusion from Hebrews 13, 13. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. To him, Piper says, when he bids us leave the securities and comforts of life and take up a risk-taking, sacrificial way of love in his service, it is not a path that we take alone. In fact, Jesus is there outside the camp in a way that he is nowhere else. He's not just telling us to go out there. He is inviting us, come out here. Here is where I am. Come to me outside the camp. The supremacy of Christ is not just his perfect fitness to bear our sins and not just the supremely valuable future reward that frees us from fear and greed and worldliness, but in his supremacy, he is also now our present personal treasure. And there he is, outside the camp, bidding us come. The sweetest fellowship with Jesus you will ever know is the fellowship of his sufferings. Jesus Christ calls us, come. Paul answered, I am ready. I am ready to go. Whatever Jerusalem is before you and me, we must say the same thing. Not out of mere duty or obligation, but with the fiery engine of gospel reflection in our heart and knowing that Jesus is there in that sacrificial service waiting for us, we have all we need to consecrate our lives to him as well. Let's pray. Father, I Lord, we, we offer to you in a fresh way the consecration of our lives. And we pray, Lord, I pray for two things over this dear church. Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, would you illuminate the reality of gospel truth in every heart. Make the fire burn. Gospel affection, gospel reflection. 
meditations on your suffering in our place, your grace and your love and the shock and surprise of it, Lord, cause that to come upon every heart. Cause those sparks to fall on everyone here. And Lord, cause us to gladly say we are ready. Cause that to be true, Lord Jesus, I pray. Lord, please cause that to be true. Lord, where there are sacrificial service present in every person in this room, Lord, cause there to be a willingness to serve you with joy in the midst of suffering. Lord, in marriages, in parental kid relationships, Lord, in the workplace, Lord, in our giving, in our money, in our generosity, Lord, in the way we use our time, like, Lord, let, let there be this, this hunger to follow you and to encounter you in the, the servanthood of you. Lord Jesus, only you can do this. Please do this for our church. Please cause us to be your servants. Please, Lord, please cause us to walk in your footsteps. Please deliver us from any selfishness, from the false idols of worldliness and worldly ease. Please rescue us, Lord, and cause us to find the joy of fellowship walking behind you. Please, Lord, I pray for every man and woman and child, every member of this church, that you would transform us, that we would treasure you above all. In your 